I was conceived in a genetics laboratory by an occultic group uh, in Geneva, Switzerland. That's where one of our main uh, facility was. It was an underground facility. And then I was raised in their training facility in Italy. So growing up, uh, ritual abuse and mind control were my experiences from conception on. All of my family members, friends, and mentors were part of this group, and growing up, I was surrounded by it. I, everyone I loved my and cared about and was attached to was part of the group. And the first few years of my life, I was actually raised in the, the training facility, so I didn't know anything outside of the group. Then I was hosted out to other countries as I got older. I have a lot of articles in my blog and two books ex uh, describing my experiences. And I have even a section called Programming where I describe the, early, the programming that's done to people in the group I was in. Another section on early childhood and that describes some of my childhood experiences, or I think it's called Growing Up, sorry. And it describes some of the childhood experiences. But mainly I experienced torture, manipulation, and mind control, and attachment bonding that began in the womb prenatally. In our group, um, we had birth mothers that were not the genetic mothers that were given to our, our group by other groups as what was considered a tithe to them. And the birth mother uh, is a teenager. Uh, my birth mother was had just turned 19. They're typically anywhere from 16 and a half to 19 years old. And she'd been trained herself for years to be my primary trainer. And she was. When I was uh, conceived and implanted in her, uh, she was my first trainer. She, uh, she f spent the first few weeks attaching me to her, telling me that she loved me and she was glad I was there and, you know, what a wonderful child I was and things like that, which a fetus loves to hear. I was implanted with 12 other zygotes. Over the course of the pregnancy, though, one by one, um, they destroyed the other zygotes until the zygote that they wanted to live uh, was the last one remaining, the one that they wanted to keep, and that was me. And that created a lot of survivor guilt, too, because, of course, I was told things like, well, you lived and they died, and it's your fault because you're taking up too much room in the womb, things like that. My birth mother also, after the first uh, six weeks of attachment, um, she also became very abusive and manipulative, asking me to take pain for her, telling me, uh, or she would be, she would be tortured and screaming and saying, I can't take any more. And then she would say, take it. And then she'd say, take a demon, take on this demon and you can take it for me. And because I loved her, I did. And you may wonder, how can a, a small fetus uh, under, or even a, a newly conceived zygote understand? It's through their spirit. The mind doesn't understand, but the spirit never forgets anything. It's kind of like when people, you know, have, been rec have no recorded brain activity in the hospital, they're in a coma, but later they can remember everything that was said around them. It's that same thing. I don't fully, I can't tell you all the biophysiological reasons why a young fetus can understand, but they do. And they do understand at an early age much more than we give uh, fetuses and infants credit for. But anyway, so prenatal training, torture and manipulation and attachment were all part of um, my experience and it continued through infancy and later childhood and into adulthood when there was rigor reprogramming. The reason the context was to create a, a mind-controlled agent who could do numerous missions in a variety of settings for the group. This included having several presentations in several countries. I'd have a presentation country A, country B, country C, country D, country E, able to speak those languages, and a multitude of skills that I could uh, pull on so that I could fulfill any mission that I was asked to do. But I also, in those uh, countries, I had... Uh, presentations and full cover stories from birth on so that I could identify as, 
as growing up in that country, and it was believable. And of course, my twins and I, and I also had doubles, we all traded out with one another. That was common our group. So I would spend about two weeks a year, say, in my American presentation, two weeks in a year, a couple in another European country, two more weeks in another European country, two weeks in Israel, and two weeks, say, another country. But my main time was spent growing up at the, in Italy in the facility. That was home for me. That was my home base. And I was programmed to seriously always want to go home. And I also had, uh, had a cover. I was also a trainer for the Illuminati. That was one of my covers. I was actually at part of another group. But when I wrote my blog in 2000, I'd only recovered the Illuminati memories. I didn't realize that I had actually infiltrated the Illuminati because I had a cover story starting with my mother who married an Illuminati. And that's, a, I, I won't go into all that here. But anyway, so I was a trainer in the Illuminati. I became the Western Regional uh, trainer, head trainer. And I also worked extensively um, with individuals in government uh, military lab. We called it my lab uh, situations. And also with a lot of the th- three-letter agencies in the U.S. and also in Europe. So those, that's some of the context. So, but again, I want to emphasize that my deepest attachments growing up were to my trainers. My biological parents were also two of my trainers. They were leaders in the group and trainers. And that was just the way it was growing up. My worst experience was being tortured for weeks to recant my Christian faith at age 14. I'd become a Christian in my American presentation, and that was not allowed by the group I was in. And so I was taken to Rome, and they uh, spent weeks torturing me and torturing my loved ones in front of me. Um, I had the experience of walking into a room, and everyone I, I loved was up on a cross. And they told me that they would kill them one by one until I recanted my faith. It took me five and a half weeks. I was raised with a cohort of 12 um, other peers. They, they raised us in groups of 12 and programmed us together in groups of 12. And so I was leader of my group at that time. And we were closer than brothers and sisters. I was willing to lay my life down for them. And I had to watch six of them tortured to death in front of me, and it caused me to recant. I didn't care if they killed me, but I couldn't stand the thought of the people I loved most being killed in that manner. And it impacted me for a long time, deeply. Um, It took years and years and years to work through the guilt and to believe that God could forgive me. And he will, and he has. He's forgiven me, and now it, it... I now know that he's forgiven me for that, and there's nothing that I, that a person can do that God can't forgive, even that. Do I have a personal concern or message? Yes. That my personal source of hope is my faith and being forgiven by God, as I just mentioned. Also, that mind control and ritual abuse are real. If you read a paper, listen to the news. I think it's obvious to most people that something's going on. Um, People talk about the shadow government, the deep state, the cabal, the elite, the WEF, blah, blah, blah. And it's obvious that there are people running things behind the scenes. Well, it's the occultic groups, the occultic societies. Um, In 2000, my blog, I mentioned that, that they, in 2000, I said that basically these occultic societies have taken over um, the areas of of government, finance, our banking system, um, education, media, and we're even infiltrating churches and religious organizations, and that they were actually running them at that point, but they just hadn't come forward. And I said that in the year twenty twenty would be would be the year that would be pivotal when they would start coming forward, and they have. They've become much more open since then, since the pandemic. I also mentioned that in 2020 that the push to prepare the world for the coming world leader would occur, and it did, uh, with a lot of the um, measures we've seen instituted and the push for world government since then. Um, 
I believe that this world leader will be announced in about seven years. I've met him. He's young. He's under age 30 at this time. He's not Klaus Schwab or the person that a lot of people are mentioning, but the person I believe is is, is in, in preparation right now and will be announced by the year 2030. Um, but my main message is that I believe that if we have faith in God, we can fight this or at least slow it down. We can stand what it what is planned for the world. I believe prayer is effective, and if we pray against it, we can slow things down. I also believe that we can be triumphant overcomers. We are not victims because I serve the true Christian God who wins. He's won the victory. If you read the Bible, he wins in the end. Satan loses. So even if this world leader comes on the stage, he will not win. He will be deposed. So things aren't hopeless. And that's the message I want people to know, that God can forgive anything in our lives, and he can do anything on our behalf. He can protect us. He can take care of us. And we can be a, a source of hope, caring, and encouragement for others during times that may seem dark.